Sometimes we look back to go ahead. Only a decade or so ago, there was a car, a car that gained such wide acceptance that it became a classic in its own time. When the Ford people were ready to produce a new kind of car, a car of tomorrow that was conceived to be the finest in the world, it had an enviable reputation before it was born because they called it the Continental. Great new engineering in power and construction were worked out. The problem was this, how to create a new Continental with the rakish charm of the classic and still have an automobile to inspire future stylists for years to come. The design went through development stages. Finally, one that captured the best of everything emerged. Sixteen thousand four hundred Michigan Avenue. Here took place a significant development in automotive history. On August 20, 1952, two men drove up to these old buildings. They were looking for a place to go to work on an idea. William Clay Ford already had been thinking about the idea for two years. He and an automotive engineer were looking for a building to set up a new organization. It had all begun back in 1939, when Edsel Ford, Bill's father, had designed a very special car. At first, it was not intended to be manufactured and sold. It was built as Edsel Ford's personal automobile. It was called the Lincoln Continental. It became a classic in its own time. Yet in all, only 5,322 were ever built. With the tremendous demand for volume-produced automobiles after World War II, manufacture of the Continental was suspended in 1948. But it never really passed from the scene. Even fan clubs of Lincoln Continental owners were organized, and people kept asking, when are they going to start making the Continental again? Now, in 1952, the work was actually underway in the gymnasium of the old schoolhouse. There were many questions. How should this car look? Should it resemble the old Continental? Or should it be a wholly new conception? Two points were clear. It must recapture the crisp styling of the old Continental. It must take its place at the head of an established family of fine cars. Into this new frame, a special passenger compartment was engineered with a new low roof line, but with the same amount of room inside. But when they finished this basic engineering, they had only begun. Now, they had to style it, design a new shape into which this new engineering package would fit. Bill Ford had a broad styling concept, which he called modern formal. There was still more than a year ahead of exploring on this alone. Sometimes they thought they had it. And then they knew they didn't. finest car in the world didn't come overnight. By the end of 1952, they had come to the basic agreement, a decision on the general overall proportions of this new Continental. To introduce the element of competition, a styling assignment on the new car was given to four outside automotive designers who would come up with independent ideas. 
All the designs had to conform to a grid laid out like a transparent checkerboard. Artist drawings can often be deceptive. The grid ensured that approved specifications were met. And all the renderings were to be in the same color, Prussian blue, so that all the pictures could be compared objectively. In the meantime, the division's own stylists were coming up with their version. It would be a fair and open competition. May 5th. 1953. When everything was set, the members of a special products committee were brought in one by one to make their decision. Each was to choose by number the design he thought was the right one. would they select? It was a great moment for Bill Ford's group when the results were in. The design they had created was the final choice. This was the one management decided to bet on. It was a multi-million dollar gamble. But was this to be the continental of tomorrow? Not by quite a bit, but it was a solid beginning. At the old school buildings, there was still plenty of midnight oil to be burned before the design would be completed. But now they could at least begin to think ahead to the problems of manufacture, of tooling and production. There were new questions now. Questions on construction of a plant in which to build this car on a virtually custom basis. That planning could now get underway while further refinements of design were plotted, sketched out, discarded, or adopted. While scale models were built and studied and modified, while full-size clay and plaster continentals were shaped and reshaped to achieve what the engineers and stylists wanted, September 29, 1953. It was as a plaster car that the new Continental received final approval. But a mock-up like this is really only a kind of three-dimensional picture. No drive it and see it the way it would really come to life, in motion. Based on what was decided about it in lifeless plaster, a copy in metal was the final step. This meant more months of planning and detail work. It would be impossible to say just what day or what hour this new car was actually born because it came to life a little at a time during the intensive effort of two years. But as good a day as any, was December 24, 1954, the day before Christmas. The handmade prototype was at last ready for its trial run. There came the instant when the wheels turned under power for the first time. Everything that had gone before was preparation. This was the beginning for Continental Mark II. Of course, there was a tremendous amount of work to do yet, 
before it could be manufactured on an assembly line. It would have to go through a complete and tough test pattern. Check its performance in desert heat. And under winter conditions that were more severe than any place on Earth. It ran for weeks on durability runs without ever stopping except for gas and oil. And in a blackout disguise, it traveled from coast to coast before final approval was given. And it was checked again and again for style. Photographed and re-photographed against all kinds of backgrounds. For engineers and stylists knew that in creating this new car, they had also created a new personality in a family of automobiles. But before the first future owner could take delivery, there were a few thousand details involved in getting production underway. A new car, a new company division. Now, a whole new plant to be built. And production in that new plant on the expressway just out of Dearborn is unlike any other production operation in the automobile industry. Relatively few cars are finished each day. Each individual engine is checked out on the dynamometer. Every body is first assembled and checked, then taken apart, numbered, and the sections painted as a set assigned to one particular car. A painstaking painting process with four double coats of paint. Each double coat is sanded and baked before the next is applied. Wheel covers are hand assembled rather than welded, producing a superior chrome finish. Higher standards in plating techniques were set to provide a chrome trim that would last unblemished for years. Hand fitted leather goes into interiors of every car. Not just the prototypes, but every Continental made goes out for a severe road test. And the results of the test will be checked down to the performance of every bolt. So this is the way it happened. Over a period of more than four years, the concept of modern formal styling came to life. Growing from rough designers, engineers, and stylist sketches to a specially designed plan and with it, new products, new jobs, carrying on a tradition, a tradition of progress. And here, tradition is brought forward ready for tomorrow. It was a challenge they offered these men, who in 1952 set out to capture the best traditions of an American classic, the Continental. And today, they find tomorrow is still ahead of them. Continental Mark II is finished, but the job of keeping it ahead is the challenge for the future.
Watch this next shot closely, and you'll see what I mean about torsion bar suspension. Notice there's no slide nor sway in the turn, even at this blistering speed. You have perfect control. All the starters at Indianapolis since 1953 have been equipped with some type of torsion bar suspension. Looks as if that's about all on this reel. You got room for another customer? Hi, Tom. Turn on the lights and come on in. This is Helen. How do you do? How do you do? And Carl? Carl, Mr. and Mrs. Bowman. Tom, I'm very glad to know you, I'm sure. And this is Tom Taylor. Another automobile bug like me. <laughs> <laughs> so Harvey's found a new audience for his home movies. He has a wonderful collection. We were enjoying every minute of it. All I did was mention this new torsion suspension I've heard so much about. Man, I sure pulled the trigger. <laughs> I didn't know the gun was loaded. <laughs> <laughs> you really put your foot in it now. I'm just an amateur. Tom's an authority on the subject. He's one of the automotive engineers who developed and perfected the first torsion bar suspension on a passenger car in this country. Well, I don't get the point of this torsion bar gadget. I don't want to go racing around corners at 90 miles an hour. I want a car that's comfortable and safe and reliable. A big, roomy car I can relax in with a powerful engine and good brakes. So where does this torsion bar business fit in? I was merely showing that the racers have proved that torsion bar suspension gives the best possible control of a car. I know what Helen's driving at, and she's right. She'd probably have gotten your point if you'd started way back at the beginning. I guess you're right at that. Go ahead, you tell her. <laughs> well, you know the story as well as I do, Harvey. Cars have always been your hobby. But they've been your bread and butter for a good many years. Why, you're part of the story. Hey, fellas, let's quit passing the buck. Yes, you said it started way back. What did you mean? Well, a moment ago, you said you wanted comfort in your car. What we in the automobile industry call a smooth, soft ride. Look over here. These old beauties were some of the best of their time. But they rode like buckboards. Jarred the living daylights out of their passengers. So from the very beginning, automotive research and engineering faced the problem of developing a softer ride. They used buggy springs and wagon springs crosswise of the chassis and lengthwise of it. As early as 1910, our company installed shock absorbers as standard equipment on this model. And of course, each year cars were being improved to provide more power and performance. But practically everything that made the ride softer decreased the load carrying capacity and increased the car's tendency to pitch and bottom. And the faster a car could go, the more hazardous the soft ride became. By the 1930s, just about when I started with the company, we had engineered and developed a manual ride control so the driver could adjust the ride to the road and the rate of travel. The need for this compromise indicates the dilemma automotive engineers faced. Soft ride versus control. In other words, what price comfort? To get the soft, easy ride the customers demanded, they had to compromise safety, stability, and control. Well, I don't see where all this is leading. My car seems to ride quite comfortably, and well, I never have any feeling that it's out of control. In a sense, you're right. Especially in good driving conditions, on smooth roads with gentle curves. My point is, from about the mid-30s until a few years ago, automotive engineers fought the battle of comfort versus control year after year. Inevitably, of course, they arrived at some fair compromises. But consider the disadvantages of conventional suspension that still existed in even the finest cars up to a couple of years ago. What happens when you fill the back seat with passengers and the trunk with luggage? Why, the back end sinks down and the front end comes up. Right. This changes the steering alignment and decreases the stability of the car. Furthermore, at night, they make your headlights ride so high they're not safe for you and they blind the oncoming traffic. And when you have to accelerate fast, the same thing happens. Front end up, back end down. Let's say you're going up and over a railroad grade crossing. The back end pitches up, then slams down and hits bottom. Or you come to a dip in the road. The back end hits bottom, then pitches up and out. 
You know, one time I threw the children, the dog, and some packages right off the back seat on the floor, just that way. When you go around the corner, even at moderate speed, the front end dips and the car tends to roll. Whenever your car's weight shifts off balance in any direction, you're losing control. When you have to make a hard stop, what happens? The car pitches forward, of course. And if you're on slippery pavement, well... And obviously, as we increase horsepower and speed, these control factors become even more critical. And no matter what they do to improve the conventional types of suspension, in which the front wheels and rear wheels are independent of each other, these things we've been talking about can't be overcome. Here's why. When you hit a bump in the road, a chain of four reactions takes place. The front wheels go up, then come down. Then the back wheels go up and come down. At normal road speeds, the front end is still dropping as the rear end is rising. This throws the back end higher. And of course, it comes down harder, hitting bottom frequently. So where does this new torsion bar suspension idea fit into the picture? I'm getting to that. That's where Tom here and the men working with him in research and engineering scooped the rest of the automobile industry. Scores of our engineers worked on it. Don't forget, we had the finest equipment, facilities, and technicians to work with. And a tradition of leadership in research and engineering that dates back to the early part of the century. We reason this way. Further attempts to reconcile the comfort versus control dilemma by merely improving conventional suspension systems could result only in minor improvements. But if we could employ an entirely new suspension principle that would give a soft ride and still keep the control already obtained in the race cars, well, we could have our cake and eat it too. And that's just what they did. Well, just what did they do? Maybe I can show you. Harvey, how are you coming with that scale model chassis you were building for me? Just about done with it. Need some touching up yet. Man, you've done a beautiful job. Harvey, that's marvelous. It really is beautiful. This shows the perfected torsion level suspension system. These long white rods are the main torsion bars. Where are the springs? The two main torsion bars are the springs. I hope you'll pardon my feminine mind, but before we go any farther, just what is a torsion bar? Well, torsion means twist. A torsion bar is a rod of spring steel that will twist when loaded, then untwist or spring back to its original condition when unloaded. Oh, I see what you mean. The spring is in the twist or the torsion of the bar. Right. And here's the key to the system. On each side, the front wheel and the rear wheel are linked together by a main torsion bar so that they work together as a team. With this system, when a front wheel goes up or down, this front linkage twists or loads the front end of the torsion bar one way or the other. And when a rear wheel goes up or down, this linkage twists or loads the rear end of the torsion bar one way or the other. Of course, when either end of the bar is loaded, it twists the other end and operates the linkage there. So the front and rear wheel work together simultaneously. When the front wheel hits a bump, it loads the main torsion bar, which instantly transmits an equal loading to the rear wheel. As the front wheel comes down again, it twists the main torsion bar in the opposite direction, causing an instant and equal reaction at the rear. As the rear wheel goes over the same bump, it twists the bar first one way, then the other, causing an equal and simultaneous loading of the front wheel. Consequently, in a car equipped with torsion bar suspension, the car raises and lowers uniformly front and rear. There's hardly any pitch, and the car literally floats over bumps and holes. When the car comes to a hard stop, its weight shifts forward, and the front end wants to dip down. But remember, the rear axle torque arms are instantly loaded the same way, so the whole car squats down with very little pitch. On the other hand, when accelerating away from a stop, which tends to lower the rear and raise the front, the rear axle torque reaction tends to raise the rear end of the car to keep it level. What keeps the car level when taking a corner? 
It's because we use the force, which makes an ordinary car sway, to actually stiffen the spring action of our torsion bar. You see, this torsion bar gives us the softest spring action when its full length is used to take the shock of a bump. The bump loads only one end of the bar at a time. But when turning a corner, the bar is loaded from both ends at the same time, front and rear wheel. So only one half of its length acts like a spring for each wheel. Now, this momentary stiffening of the spring action is what keeps the car level on corners. Another thing, this new torsion bar suspension system automatically levels the car when the load is changed. That is, when more passengers or baggage are added. These two short torsion bars and this electric motor actually do the leveling. When the rear end of the car is loaded or unloaded, the levelizer mechanism starts automatically. A built-in time delay keeps it from working until it knows that this load change is not just another bump. After several seconds, the mechanism levels the car. The load levelizer automatically keeps the car within 5 eighths inch of level at all times. The best way to appreciate the sure-footed control of this new torsion level ride is to see it in action. Compare it with a car that has no torsion bar suspension nor load levelizer. A car we thought was tops only a couple of years ago. With our torsion level ride, as we call it, we can have both comfort and control. We can have our cake and eat it, too. Yes, I see what you mean, all right. You must have a perfectly fascinating job to design and develop things like this. It never gets monotonous, that's for sure. There's the constant challenge to make one new improvement on top of another. For instance, the elimination of the shift lever from transmission systems. The what? How can you drive without it? Up until recently, even the so-called automatic transmissions have not been completely automatic. In this day and age, a truly automatic transmission system should respond to an electronic control at the touch of a fingertip. It should be as simple and easy to operate as push-button radios and home appliances. So our engineers have designed and developed an automatic push-button selector that controls our automatic transmission by an electronic device, as easy as turning on a light. It gives you instantaneous drive range selection at the touch of a finger. Touch the button, and away you go. Truly automatic motoring. What a wonderful convenience. Real touch and go driving. Nothing like it puts an exciting new sensation in driving. Like taking off on a trip to the moon. What happens if you accidentally push the wrong button? It's foolproof. An automatic safety control built right into the electronic selector cancels your mistake. Have you figured out how to eliminate the driver yet? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes solving one problem gives us the answer to another. For instance, Drivers like the ease and convenience of an automatic transmission. But they also want the gas mileage that overdrive gives. So one of the greatest improvements we could make would be to build the economy of overdrive into our automatic transmission. Well, how come that's never been done before? <laughs> because the combination is mighty hard to do. To achieve the economy of a slower operating engine at a given car speed, it required three elements in the right combination. We had to have an ideal engine, transmission, rear axle combination. A numerically low ratio that called for exceptionally high torque in the engine. Fortunately, our engine designers were Johnny on the spot with the answer. Their problem had been to develop and build the most powerful engine with the highest torque ever delivered at the rear wheel in a passenger car. As a result, we got the ideal power ratio we need for overdrive economy in an automatic transmission. You have to see this new combination on the proving grounds to appreciate the results it achieves. It provides a blistering getaway from a standstill. It 
has tremendous reserve torque for climbing steep grades. And the new economy of overdrive in our automatic transmission, plus our push-button control, are an engineer's dream come true. You see, we were able to improve our automatic transmission and rear axle ratio to build overdrive economy into them by building an engine that delivers maximum torque, efficiency, and fuel economy. Boy, that sounds like a wonderful combination. Here's another spot where there was room for improvement, the conventional differential. Why? Well, if you've ever been caught in soft sand or mud, you'll know what I mean. The one rear wheel that's in the hole just spins and digs itself in deeper, while the other rear wheel stands idle, and you're stuck. This is the path of the power through the old differential. Following the line of least resistance, it always went to the spinning wheel that has no traction. Now, to overcome this, our engineers succeeded in designing a simple method of transferring the power through a new kind of differential to the wheel that's on firm ground and has traction. As a result, the car with the new twin traction differential has less of a tendency to dig itself into sand or mud. But in case your car should be driven into a hole or a deep rut where the traction is poor, the moment one rear wheel begins to lose traction by spinning, twin traction instantly transfers the power to the other wheel. And out you go. On rough washboard roads, where sometimes the rear wheel bounces and spins when power is applied, this new instantaneous power transfer from the bouncing wheel to the wheel that has good traction avoids that chattering spin. It makes a smoother and safer turn on rough or slippery pavements. And on winter ice, where the old differential would spin one wheel helplessly while the car stands still, now with twin traction, you not only move off the ice easily, you have enough power and enough traction to pull five cars off the ice. This is the first great improvement in rear axle design since we introduced the high point gear rear axle in the early 20s. What else have you up your sleeve? Oh, we're working on all kinds of developments we can't even talk about yet. You see, in automotive research and engineering, many of us are planning as much as five to 10 years hey, ahead. We've got to get going. I promised Beverly and Jean we'd meet them at the club just about now. Well, sure. Give me just a couple of moments to fix my powder. Settle down, boys. We'll be a while yet. <laughs> There's no point in taking both cars. We're all coming back here afterward. Which one shall it be? Let's take this one. OK, we'll take your car and leave mine here. Who's going to drive? You've already decided that, haven't you? Say, Harv, let you and I sit in the back for a change, just to see how it feels. OK, by me. something really terrific, watch. How about that, huh? 
What'll they think of next? This 1957 model has all the gadgets anyone could ask for. Americans felt prosperous, and their cars reflected it. We wanted everything at our fingertips, everything to be automatic. We expected luxury, and in this model, we even received a complimentary gift of very expensive perfume. We also were offered new elegant style doors that opened from the center of the car. Now let's take a look at some vintage Cadillac commercials. The first commercials we shall see are from 1958, and the second two are from 1957, one of which mentions the practicality of owning a used Cadillac. Cadillac presents Motordom's Masterpiece. Cadillac's newest marvel of styling and engineering is now at your Cadillac dealers. The 1958 Cadillac is brilliantly new in beauty, with fabrics and appointments that introduce a new concept of interior elegance. And Cadillac's dynamic 1958 engine and revolutionary air suspension provide a totally new experience in modern motoring. See and drive Motordom's masterpiece, the 1958 Cadillac. As you can readily see, the Cadillac motor car for 1958 is a rare masterpiece in all the things that make a Cadillac a Cadillac. There is its clean, graceful symmetry of line and the protection provided by its many safety features. Every window of every Cadillac is safety plate glass. And of course, there is its remarkable look of stature and substance. Never before have Fleetwood coach crafted comfort and spaciousness been blended into such interior elegance. And most assuredly, it has set its own extraordinary pace in modern motor car performance. And optional on every model is the wonder of air suspension. In the way it looks, rides, and drives, this is Cadillac's finest. We hope that you will take the time to see and drive this magnificent new Cadillac very soon. owners are frequently amazed at the public's high regard for the car of cars, even after it has seen two or three years of service. That in itself is a wonderful reason for buying a quality value late model used Cadillac. But in addition, there is its great practicality. Many one owner low mileage used Cadillacs are priced considerably less than many medium and low priced new cars that are not their equal in prestige, Fleetwood luxury and safety features. Every window of every Cadillac is safety plate glass. So if you want a car that is economical to drive and to operate and a pride and pleasure to own, make it a point to spend 30 minutes at the wheel of a used Cadillac soon. have seen the incomparable new Continental Mark III and the new 1958 Lincoln. Now you know you have quality products to sell that can really make you money. You have what one automotive magazine has already called 
the most radically changed cars of 1958. Actually, no such totally new cars have been produced in the last 20 years. Your first look told you that. But to help you really get out and sell these truly new cars, you're going to need more than a once-over look and a lot of glamorous words. You need the answers to a lot of specific questions before you can do a real job of selling the new Continental and Lincoln point for point, feature for feature, and dollar for dollar against any and all competition. So that's what we're going to give you, the answers to your questions. We went out to the field, to salesmen exactly like yourselves, to find just what you needed most to know. Here are the questions we came back with. And here are your answers, without any frills. How many cars are we selling this year? Two. Two great cars. The new Continental Mark III, and in the same classic tradition, the new Lincoln for 1958, in the Premier Series and the Capri Series. Uh, how many models in all? In 1958, you'll have ten new motor cars to sell. Four Continentals and six Lincolns. The Continental, Lincoln Premier and Lincoln Capri each offer a two-door hardtop coupe, a four-door hardtop Landau, and a four-door sedan. And in addition, there is the all-new Continental Convertible, the most fabulous convertible ever designed. What's the difference between this new Continental Mark III and the Mark II? The new Continental Mark III has been expanded to full sedan size. And to maintain the exact same proportions of the classic Continental design, it has been lengthened. It's more than 10 and a half inches longer than the Mark II. It's better than two inches wider. So you have a far more spacious motor car inside and still have the timeless classic Continental design. It's tradition of quality craftsmanship. It's dignity, elegance, and luxury. Instead of just one Continental model, you now have four to sell, the coupe, Landau, sedan, and convertible. What about the price of the Continental? That's more big news. All four models are in comparable values in the fine car field. They offer all the Continental prestige and magnificence at a much lower cost than the Mark II. As a matter of fact, the Lincoln for 1958 in both its Premier and Capri series will have the same classic elegance as the Continental because they have been designed and engineered in the same continental tradition and put together with the same demanding quality workmanship. Does that mean the Lincoln is a bigger car this year, too? Yes, indeed. It's a totally new automobile, the longest and lowest motor car in the fine car field. In fact, it's more than four inches longer than the 1957 Lincoln. Its wheelbase is five inches longer. And because of its entirely new method of body construction, it has been lowered a full 3.75 inches and still provides headroom comparable to 1957. The long, flat, Continental-style hood is lower than ever before. What are the differences between the Continental and the Lincoln? Differences I can point out to my prospects. Well, let's compare them from every angle. Look at the car on top. That's a front view of the Continental. Below is the Lincoln. They both share the same massive wraparound bumpers, the same low look of stability, the same instantly recognized hallmark of canted dual headlights. But the Continental keeps its traditional lattice grille design. For the Lincoln, both the Premier and Capri series, a fresh contemporary styling theme has been created for the grille in horizontal lines that emphasize the wide, close-to-the-road look of this graceful motor car. Continental and Lincoln nameplates are in gold anodized script. Well, what about those headlights? What's the extra pair? Parking lights or what? No. The Continental and Lincoln's dual headlights are really dual headlights. And full-sized ones, not undersized ones jammed into a space originally designed for single lights. That's one of the reasons for the canted design. Another is to provide instant identification on the highway for the Continental and Lincoln. For full beam driving, all four lights are lit, providing the fullest possible field of illumination. And because of the canted design, the low, wide front view lines of the car will be emphasized even at night. For low beam city driving, only the upper pair are used so that the car's extreme width 
is still emphasized. Each of these new cars has its own distinctive identifying hood ornament. The traditional four-pointed continental star at the top, the Lincoln star below. In profile, both are truly distinguished motor cars with long, low continental lines and traditional continental styling of the roof, hood, and rear deck surfaces. The new deep sloping dual curve windshield is a standout feature on both and you'll notice it rises cleanly from the metal of the cowl. There's no interruption of its graceful line by the usual metal molding at the base, as there will be on your competitors' models this year. On the Lincoln, the same is true of the big panoramic rear window, which helps give Lincoln a better than 11% increase in total glass area. Because of a feature that is exclusively continental in the fine car field, the fully retractable rear window there's a new and distinctive silhouette for the Continental this year. The Continental is also distinguished by a restrained use of chrome along the lower edge of the car. The Lincoln, in keeping with its fresh contemporary styling theme, displays a bold chrome spear along the body. On the Premier Series, this spear terminates in the eight-pointed Lincoln star. The star is absent on the Capri. And above the spear molding on the rear quarter panel appears the Premier or Capri nameplate. Continental's nameplate in raised gold anodized lettering is on the front fenders. And the distinctive Continental star appears again on the side of the roof at the rear just above the belt line. Both Continental and Lincoln have a distinctive wheel scallop sculptured in metal on the front fenders. Another new styling hallmark. Both cars feature new, smaller, 14-inch wheels with a 950 by 14-inch tire that puts a greater area of tire tread on the road. The Continental is further set off by its special wheel cover design, another exclusive Continental feature. What's the story on that retractable rear window in the Continental? On the Continental only, the big center section of the rear window is fully retractable. It is electrically operated from the driver's position. This is a big selling feature, unmatched by any other car in the fine car field. With the rear window retracted all the way, a Continental owner can have straight through ventilation, an open air feeling he cannot get in any competitive car. The fluted chrome frame for this window, projecting to the rear, is not only a unique styling feature, but gives added protection against rain. The L-shaped moldings at the base, sweeping to the rear, give a sense of forward motion. Even the convertible has this retractable rear window, making it the only convertible in its field available with a rear window of glass. Now, let's see how both cars differ in the rear. Solidity, stability, and the clean cut lines of the continental tradition are evident in the rear styling of both cars. There's a new and distinctively different concave design to the back panel in 1958. And each car reflects its own individual front grille treatment in the back panel design. The Continental above, the Lincoln below. Set in the slender oval of the back panel, each has its own original treatment of the rear lights. On the Continental, there are twin tail lights. The outboard tail lights also serve as stop lights and turn indicators. The white inboard lights are backup lights. On the Lincoln, there is an integrated lighting arrangement that merges into the ends of the oval. On the gas filler lid in the center of the panel, the Continental repeats its distinctive star. The Premier and Capri display a script letter L. Well, other than those differences, are the Continental and the Lincoln the same? That's right. They're the same basic car. Same wheelbase, same engine, same transmission, same instrument panel, and everything else the same. Naturally, the interior trim is different. We'll get to that later. And because of the Continental's exclusive new retractable rear window and the mechanism to raise and lower it, in the Continental there is no package tray and the rear seat has been moved forward about three and a half inches. What's the difference in inside room between the four-door models and the coupes? None at all. Coupe, Landau, and Sedan all use the same body shell. The interior dimensions of Continental, Lincoln Premier and Lincoln Capri are all the same, except for that slight move forward for the Continental rear seat. 
In fact, one of the biggest stories you'll have to tell this year is the tremendous spaciousness and roominess of these great cars. I heard we have a new body construction this year. Is it really new? Because if it is and it's an exclusive, I sure want to go to town on that. And you can. It's completely new and exclusive in the fine car field. It's so new that traditional production facilities couldn't make it. That's why the brand new plant was built for Lincoln, designed solely for the quality production of single unit bodies. We call it uniframe construction. This uniframe construction means that instead of a body shell bolted to a separate frame, the body and strength members are welded into one integral unit. Instead of 18 bolts or so tying a body to a frame, every Continental and Lincoln has some 7,500 weld points, making the entire assembly one rigid piece. Actually, this construction method is closer to the way aircraft are put together than to the traditional way of building cars. Well, what's the reason for this new body? What does it give the customer? Quality. The quality a fine car should have. It makes a far stronger, more rigid unit, which resists twisting out of shape. The door and window openings stay the way they're supposed to be. You get tight-fitting doors that stay tight-fitted. And with no body bolts to loosen, squeaks or rattles are virtually a thing of the past. Uniframe construction gives Lincoln the big extra margin of weight, solidity, and structural strength that a fine car owner demands. How much heavier is the car? Total curb weight is about 5,100 pounds. That's about 400 pounds heavier than the 1957 Lincoln. The styling of this new body follows a universal trend. Everywhere you go, in industry, architecture, and all kinds of products, the direction is to simplicity and purity of design. More than any other car in the field, this 1958 Lincoln personifies that trend. Because of the marriage of Lincoln and Continental, this year, every Lincoln has the clean, restrained Continental styling. Every Lincoln has its low, flat hood and deck lines, its distinctive silhouette. Okay, the car is beauty. Everyone who comes in can see that it's beautiful right away. But what else is this design gonna mean then? What's the length gonna mean? What's the lowness gonna mean? First, this new design has given Continental and Lincoln the finest riding qualities ever. With five inches added to the wheelbase, it has a smooth and effortless, truly luxurious ride. Because of the single unit body, it's a safer ride and a silent one. But this new method of bodybuilding means more than that. Uniframe construction has let the engineers design a body four inches lower, making the center of gravity lower, for greater road-hugging stability and still come up with more room inside than ever. More headroom, despite the lower roof, and much more hip room, shoulder room, and leg room. Notice especially the tremendous leg room for the front seat passenger. In what other automobile in the industry is there room to cross and uncross your legs with ease? Well, the thing I like to sell is comfort in riding and driving. How do we stack up in that? Believe me, you've never had a better sales story to tell. Besides the tremendous roominess in the 1958 Continentals and Lincolns, you have the longer, lower, single unit construction that's safer and quieter. Foam rubber seat cushions provide extra seating comfort. And the riding qualities. Here again, it's an all new story. Redesigned ball joint suspension for the front wheel and a new rear suspension system, which brings a new meaning to fine car comfort. In 1958, the rear suspension uses coil springs, springs designed to do exactly the job they're supposed to do, and that is to provide the most comfort for the passengers. The thrust of driving and the pull of braking no longer need to be transmitted through the springs. Those forces go directly to the car through new trailing arms and there is a track bar tying the rear of the suspension system to the rear of the single unit body, giving greater lateral stability. But this suspension system does more than provide a more comfortable ride. Now there is virtually no rear end squat when you accelerate, and freedom from the usual front end dip when you stop. There's visual comfort too, 
in the great expanse of the new dual curve windshield, a windshield that both sweeps around at the sides and slopes back at the top to give even greater visibility. How about distortion? This new compound curved windshield has been optically designed to be free of distortion. You're not going to have any complaints about that. Well, what about the engine? Anything new there? Plenty. The engine is all new. You have a lot to talk about. It's the biggest V8 ever put in a Lincoln. 430 cubic inch displacement. 10.5 to 1 compression ratio. 375 horsepower and 490 foot-pounds of torque at 3,100 RPM. But there's more than just power. There's the new in-block combustion chamber design for greater engine efficiency and durability. In this new engine, the combustion chamber is in the cylinder block. The cylinder head is perfectly flat, and when joined with the engine block, it forms a wedge-shaped combustion chamber, a chamber designed in conjunction with the new step-top pistons to provide complete turbulence of the air-fuel mixture for more efficient combustion. The full machining of the flat cylinder head makes possible completely uniform combustion chambers, so you get identical compression ratio in each cylinder. That means you've got a truly balanced engine that will run quieter, smoother, and have a longer life. But that's not all. The 1958 Continental and Lincoln engines introduce another industry first with their exclusive three-stage cooling system. With two thermostats, this completely controlled pressure system directs the engine coolant to the area where it is needed most. First, just to the cylinder heads and intake manifold, then to the engine block as well, and finally to the radiator too, when complete circulation begins. The radiator is bigger than in 1957, with 485 square inches of cooling area. The fuel system is new. Air fed to the carburetor is thermostatically controlled. Whatever the weather conditions, its temperature is always ideal for the engine's needs. There's a new and larger four-barrel carburetor with two barrels to furnish the necessary fuel-air mixture in normal driving ranges and two additional barrels that automatically cut in at higher speeds or for quick acceleration. And with another exclusive new feature of this big new engine, the fuel-air mixture is kept at the proper temperature on its way to the combustion chambers. The water-jacketed intake manifold keeps water constantly circulating under the intake passages. And Lincoln's exhaust system has not only been enlarged throughout to make a better breathing engine, but the new design alternates intake and exhaust valves, so no two are adjacent to create combustion chamber hotspots. There are really and literally too many new features about this engine to go into here. But the complete story and the selling story will be found in your new 1958 Continental and Lincoln data book. Is there anything new in the transmission? Indeed there is. In 1958, Lincoln's advanced turbo-drive automatic transmission, standard on every model of the Continental and Lincoln, has been beefed up to handle the greatly increased torque of the engine. And there's a big new story in the torque converter. The unit has been redesigned with a new contour that gives a more positive hydraulic action of the fluid. It is contained in a rugged new housing, now made of steel instead of aluminum, and welded. Why is it welded? To give it a lifetime seal against oil leakage and protection against internal operating troubles. Gear selection is by lever, the proven and natural method. And its new design permits the car to be started with the lever in the park position as well as in neutral. Thus, if the car is on an incline, there's no need to fuss with the brakes. The park position holds the car safely while the engine is started. I'd like to know what features are standard on these 1958 cars. All the major power assists are standard on these luxurious new cars. Automatic transmission, power steering, and power brakes. Power windows and the four-way power seat are standard Continental and Lincoln Premier equipment. Power windows are optional in the Capri series, and a six-way power seat is available as an option on all models. Anything new about these features? 
Yes, there is. Although the wheels are smaller this year, Lincoln engineers have designed brakes with much wider shoes, so that there has actually been a 43% increase in effective braking area. And speaking of brakes, the parking brake now can be released by the foot as well as set by the foot. The switches for the power windows have been relocated, putting these controls exactly where usage dictates they should be, at the most convenient location. Another exclusive feature for 1958 is this electric lockout switch, which cuts out the individual window controls and puts all windows, including the vent windows, solely under control of the driver. On the Continental, the switch for the power-operated retractable rear window is also here on the driver's armrest. What are the optional features this year? Your data book contains the complete list of options and accessories for the 1958 Continental and Lincoln. But here are some of the most important. A six-way power seat, electric door locks, a remote control electric trunk lock, an electronic headlight dimmer, heater and defroster, air conditioning, push-button power lubrication, automatic starter, a new AM radio, a new FM radio tuner, an extra fidelity radio speaker, tinted glass, nylon tires, directed power differential, and power vent windows. Many of these were options in 1957, but there are new and exclusive features that are going to be big selling stories in 1958. We want to go into those in some detail. An entirely new heater and air conditioning system, an exclusive electric trunk lock release, and a brand new radio story. Let's take the heater defroster unit first. The first big selling feature is Lincoln's simple heater control. A single knob activates an electrical servo mechanism to choose any degree of heat or ventilation without heat or defrosting. There are two big heaters, one under each front fender, where they do not take up valuable space. There are four outlets for heated air, two of them in the cowl trim panels to warm the front compartment. But the rear seat passengers have not been forgotten in this newly designed system. Warm air is carried through ducts that are built right into the front door panels to rear seat outlets that have louvers to direct the warm air flow. But the new 1958 air conditioning system is even more of an innovation. It's the only front-mounted air conditioning system in the industry that provides a direct flow of cooled air to the rear seat. Because it uses the same built-in ducts to the rear seats as the heating unit, there are no plastic tubes to spoil the elegance of Continental and Lincoln interior styling. Cars equipped with air conditioning have five outlets in the front compartment alone one at the driver's left and two in the center of the instrument panel, as well as the two floor area heater outlets. Air conditioning controls have been built into the same single knob control used for the heater. Complete details are in your data book, and only by getting completely familiar with its operation can you do a real selling job. In 1958, the exquisitely handcrafted aircraft style instrument cluster groups every instrument and control just where they belong, within easy reach of the driver. This new design provides an almost unbelievable amount of room for front seat passengers. Well, what about the radio, or just what's included in the radio package? The ultimate in car radio reception. Continental and Lincoln's AM radio not only offers manual tuning and five push-button controls for preferred stations, but also town and country automatic tuning, which can be operated by hand or by a special foot-operated button. The package includes two 9-inch speakers for front and rear on the Lincoln. In the Continental, which has no rear speaker location, a 4-inch auxiliary speaker is mounted in the instrument panel next to the 9-inch speaker. Also included is Lincoln's new rear-mounted antenna which automatically extends 32 inches when the radio is turned on and retracts when it is turned off. And also available as an option for the first time is a special FM tuner for truly discriminating listeners. Another option for Continental and Lincoln customers who want the ultimate in power servants is a new remote control deck lid release. 
A simple key turn switch electrically unlocks the luggage compartment. A warning light signals that it's open and remains lit until the deck lid is closed, which automatically locks it. What about ashtrays and lighters? Since both Continental and Lincoln are truly the last word in elegant motor cars, attention is paid to the smallest detail. Even the ashtrays carry the rich look of quality handcrafting. There are five of them, and each has its lighter. Five ashtrays conveniently placed, and five cigarette lighters, three in front and two in the rear. I'd like a rundown on the difference between the Premier Series and the Capri. That's an easy one. Here they both are, the Premier Coupe and the Capri Coupe. Can you tell them apart? You shouldn't be able to, except for the series name on the quarter panel and the Lincoln Star forward of the side spear molding on the Premier. There are only three major differences between the 1958 Premier and Capri. Power windows are standard on the Premier, optional on the Capri. The four-way power seat also standard on the Premier, is not available on the Capri. However, the six-way power seat is optional on both Premier and the Capri. And there are different interior trim schemes. Outside of that, they are the same car. This means that in the 1958 Lincoln Capri, you're going to have the most saleable car you have ever had to meet that Cadillac 62. Feature for feature, you have the same quality story to tell about the Capri that you have about the Premier. And because of the marriage of Continental and Lincoln, both series are hallmarked with the classic elegance of the incomparable Continental. What about the Capri interior trim? Are we going to have more than just an all-fabric trim? Yes, indeed. While there is one basic Capri trim scheme, this year, you'll be able to offer it to your customers in a combination of fabric and leather grain vinyl, which we have named Caprolon, as well as in fabric alone. There will be four rich-looking two-tone color schemes to choose from in either combination. This really gives you something to meet competition. What about the rest of the trim schemes? For the Lincoln Premier, there are two. One for the all-fabric scheme, with four different color combinations, and one available in leather or fabric and leather with a selection of 16 combinations. And for the exclusive Continental, the most luxurious looking trim and upholstery scheme of all, available in fabric, imported Scotch leather, or fabric and leather with a choice of 18 combinations in all. Is leather trim standard equipment? No, it is an extra cost option, except on the convertible where it is standard. Is there anything new about the paint jobs this year? There certainly is. First of all, in the way the exterior finish is applied. Every model has a beautiful enamel finish, painstakingly and meticulously applied by skilled craftsmen. Nothing is spared to make the exterior finish worthy of the custom coachwork of these great cars. And in 1958, more exterior colors and color combinations are offered by Lincoln than ever before. There are 17 basic colors for the 1958 Lincoln. And in addition, four special colors for the Continental Mark III, which are also offered at extra cost on Premiers and Capris. 21 colors in all, and they'll be available in 104 two-tone combinations, more than Lincoln has ever offered before. I think safety features are pretty important. What have we got to talk about? Many prospects are definitely interested in safety. We've covered lots of the safety features in answering earlier questions, but let's just sum them all up. First, the stronger, more rigid structure of the unitized body, the greater visibility of the big dual curved windshield, greater braking area, for though the wheels are but 14 inches in diameter, there's a 43% increase in brake lining area. The more powerful engine provides all the reserve power a driver might need. The window lockout switch, electric door locks. Not only do you have padded instrument panel and padded sun visors, but padded door panels as well. The steering wheel, of course, is of safety design. With these features to show to your prospects, you can sell them one of the safest cars ever built. Well, we have a pretty good performance story this year, don't we? You have a tremendous performance story. 
with Lincoln's totally redesigned new engine, a stronger and yet lighter engine displacing 430 cubic inches with a compression ratio of 10.5 to 1, 375 horsepower, and 490 foot-pounds of torque at 3,100 RPM, the 1958 Continental and Lincoln are superlative road cars, unmistakably the finest performance in the fine car field. How's the cornering? Tests show these powerful motor cars have lost none of the superior cornering characteristics for which Lincoln is famous. In fact, with the brand new rear suspension system, it's better than ever. But there's no point in talking performance and easy handling. The way to sell it is to show it, demonstrate it. Put the prospect behind the wheel and let him discover the amazing story himself. Well, performance and handling are okay for men, but uh, what do these cars have to appeal to women? Everything. Magnificence, elegance, and luxury from the superbly tasteful exterior styling down to the smallest detail like the lustrous, jewel-like metalwork in window switches and ash receivers. Inside and out, every model of the Lincoln and the Continental bespeaks character and prestige and high fashion that will satisfy the most discriminating taste. Nothing is lacking in comfort, in convenience, in luxurious roominess. And never has a car of whatever size been easier to handle and to drive. The 1958 Continentals and Lincolns are the most effortless handling cars in the fine car field. This time every year, everything's always new, new, the newest ever. What I can use is a list of what's really new in the 1958 product. A list of the biggest sales stories I can tell. As you've probably realized by now, Lincoln in 1958 has the most totally new line of motor cars in the fine car field. And we mean really new. Starting with its new single unit body, a completely new way of manufacturing Lincolns, which brings new safety, new strength and rigidity, and a new kind of luxury ride to the fine car field, as well as the highest standards of quality coachwork. And spaciousness. The new cars are unequaled in interior spaciousness. Don't overlook that selling feature. There's the new suspension system, which sets up new standards of fine car riding and handling. You've got a new engine to talk about, the most powerful V8 ever put in a Lincoln, with a brand new in-block design of a combustion chamber that means new performance, new, quieter, more efficient power, with a three-stage cooling system and a water-jacketed intake manifold. You've got a completely new heating and air conditioning system, scientifically designed to be the most easily operated system ever put in an automobile. You've got totally new styling, clean, simplified design, inspired by the classic elegance of the incomparable Continental, which puts a new, unmistakable kind of beauty on the American road. And there's more to sell than beauty. Longer wheelbase, a lower center of gravity, greater glass area, are functional selling features that stem from this Continental-inspired design. You've got a new Continental Mark III, a classic motor car in its finest edition, plus a new kind of Continental, the superb new Continental Convertible, and a new position for Continental in price to offer you greater coverage of the luxury car market than you have ever had before. And in all of this, in every exquisite motor car produced, Lincoln and Continental, new meaning to the word quality when applied to an automobile. You ask what's really new? In 1958, you have the greatest new opportunity you have ever had. Whether your prospects want comfort, convenience, safety, performance, prestige, a distinctively different motor car, true classic elegance and quality. Any and all can be theirs in the Continental Mark III and the new Lincoln. For such quality motor cars, there must be nothing less than quality salesmanship. You cannot afford to sell these masterpieces any other way. They are unmistakably the finest motor cars in the fine car field. The incomparable Continental Mark III and the magnificent new Lincoln.
Let's sell them. And let's sell them right. Chrysler Division presents the 1959 Imperial, America's finest motor car. Imperial, the name that's a symbol of the finest in luxury and elegance. By Imperial Decree, Elegance. By Imperial Decree, Silence and Luxury. By Imperial Decree, Distinction and Prestige. Yes, the majestic Imperial still wears the crown for distinctive styling and engineering achievement among the luxury cars of America. Here is a car that's beautiful and distinguished, whatever way you look at it. The biggest style changes have been made at the front. Low, massive, elegant. A masterpiece of rugged, sparkling beauty that gives real front-end protection as well as added distinction to the great imperial line of motor cars for 1959. The new dual headlights have been lowered to be in line with the grille. And notice the new treatment of the front fender over the lights. New front fender ornaments add a touch of elegance without being flashy. There are two changes at the side. One is the longer front fender molding, the other is the new side sweep molding. As you see, it now flares out and down into a wide expanse of gleaming chrome. Sparkling new wheel covers add to the Imperial's classic beauty. An all new bumper adds an important note of extra quality and refinement to the entire rear design. The popular flight sweep deck lid is available again this year. Here is a feature that's distinctly Imperial. And when it comes to real Imperial exclusiveness, you've got it in any one of the three available roof treatments on two-door and four-door hardtops. This particular one is the Imperial Landau roof and features an entirely new textured leather finish for the canopy section. Actually, it's a special kind of finish right on the metal that can't peel off or show worn spots. But it looks like leather, it accents the Landau and gives the car a special extra luxury look. Here's the Silvercrest roof. The entire forward section of the roof is satin finished stainless steel instead of the usual paint. This adds a lot of richness and distinction. The third available roof treatment is a combination of the first two. This is the Silvercrest Landau roof and has both the textured leather effect on the canopy section and a stainless steel front roof section. This roof treatment gives the Imperial the richest, most custom-built appearance of any production car in America. Now we'll look at the interior styling. Here's a close-up of one of the finest improvements made in the interior of the 1959 Imperial. It's the new instrument panel, which has been completely redesigned. It's more beautiful than ever, and it has a lot of special distinction. At the same time, it's the most functional panel ever to be put on an American car. There's a new horizontal ribbon-type speedometer. It's good-looking, and it's extremely easy to read. The panels at either end of the speedometer are the right and left turn indicator flashes. And a big feature is the lineup of controls on the panel itself, such as parking brake, release lever, light switches, ignition switch, and so forth. A clear plastic plate covers the entire instrument cluster. It's edge lighted so that the instruments are easily identified in red. Another lineup of controls is located and clearly marked just below the panel itself. Two of these are standard on every Imperial. One is the knob for resetting the trip odometer. It's just to the left of the steering column. To the right of the column is the knob for setting the electric clock. 
The others are provided as required. Over at the left of the panel, arranged vertically, you can see the push buttons for the torque plate transmission. This year, the drive button and the reverse button are separated by the neutral button for safer driving. In a similar vertical position to the right are the controls for either the new push button heater or for the new push button air conditioner, whichever optional unit is desired. The push button air conditioner combines both heating and air conditioning functions. The lever below controls the temperature. In addition to the beautifully designed instrument panel, the interior of the 1959 Imperial is a rich combination of harmonious color. Here are new fabrics, new materials, and new styling, all combined to give the most luxurious interior possible. And speaking of new interior styling, here is an exclusive feature that puts Imperial far ahead of all competition. 1959 Imperial offers exciting new development in seat design. Here is a natural for Imperial buyers. As demonstrated in the Chrysler engineering film, this seat is revolutionary in front seat styling and convenience. Every demo should have one. The standard front seat on all Imperial models is the luxurious notched back seat covered with the finest fabrics obtainable. Crown Imperial four-door sedans have a fabric of nylon mixed with Dacron and cotton. The bolsters are of high-grade broadcloth. Custom Imperial features a mixture of nylon and rayon fabric with vinyl bolsters. The Baron models have all broadcloth upholstery made of 100% wool, giving a rich, extra luxurious appearance. And here's a touch of added luxury and convenience in front compartment design. Both the Crown and LeBaron feature new front door armrests with a hidden storage compartment. Also featured on the 1959 Crown and LeBaron is a folding center front seat armrest in the four-door hardtop and four-door sedan. These added touches of elegance are good selling points. And while you're looking at the front compartment, notice the new safety recessed steering wheel and that sturdy crossbar with a soft, protective padding on it. A full opening above the bar allows easy reading of the instruments. A firm, restful grasp is provided by two ribbed grip areas with thumb indentations. Yes, from front to back, luxurious elegance is the keynote of the 1959 Imperial Interiors. A folding center armrest gives added luxury and comfort to the rear seat of all Imperial models except the convertible. For rear seat passenger protection, a safety bolster is built into the top of the front seat back on all Imperials. Deep piled carpeting in dark harmonizing color tones is used on the floor as well as for scuff panels at the bottoms of doors and on the lower half of the front seat backs. Yes, as shown on this crown, the roominess, the comfort, the ultra-fine car feeling, everything has been improved to make the 1959 Imperial a leader in style and luxury in the fine car field. In just a moment, we'll tell you how our engineers achieved more roominess. Also, you'll find out why Imperial will be at the top in quality as well as in styling. In order to provide the best in Imperial quality, the decision was made to build the Imperial motor car in a plant by itself. The Imperial plant you see here allows Imperial plant personnel to work on Imperial only. Each car is given detailed attention and inspection and orders can be handled much more efficiently. In this new plant, inspection, tooling, and engineering employees utilize their full time on Imperial, and every car is fully tested. This, combined with a stepped up, all out quality control, is a guarantee to our customers that they'll receive the finest automobiles ever produced. The famous Imperial body is completely different from any body built by the Chrysler Corporation. The designing engineers had one goal in mind, quality workmanship that would produce the finest in strong, safe, quiet, luxurious ride. With this thought in mind, new features have been designed for the 1959 Imperial body. 
For example, the floor pan has been lowered two inches in the rear compartment to provide more roominess. This is made possible by a new drop rail frame. And the new floor pan is stronger than ever because of a supporting beam attached to the frame. So for 1959, the rear seat passengers in the Imperial will sit more comfortably and with plenty of room for their feet in an easy, relaxed position. The front and rear seats are higher and there's more rear seat leg room. This change is an important addition to Imperial's big car atmosphere. And here you see the newly designed B-post on the four-door hardtop Imperials. The big flange or outside brace is completely gone. Now you can get in or out without anything getting in the way of your feet. Also, it adds more leg room. This combination of better seating and redesigned B-post gives you a real selling point in hardtop rear seat roominess. And when you ride in an Imperial, you really ride in silence. The Imperial for 1959 gives a more quiet ride because of extra insulation against road noises and vibration. First, undercoating is applied to the entire underside of the body, including rear wheel housings and the engine side of the dash panel. Sound deadening mastic is sprayed on the inside of the floor pan, including trunk, quarter panels in the trunk area, front fenders under the headlights, engine side shields, inside of doors, in the underside above the fuel tank, and inside of the dash panel. Also, new Tough Flex insulation with improved sound absorption qualities is attached to the entire roof panel. This is a one-half inch thick wood fiber product with a perforated paper center. Improved insulation is also used under the hood on the interior of the dash panel and the cowl panel with padding applied to the floor. In addition, silencer pads are used at the steering column opening inside the rear deck lid and on the shelf panel. Also, the new Imperial has greater strength and rigidity than ever before. The use of extra struts in the front sheet metal, reinforced front fenders, extra thick steel for the inner and outer roof rails of hardtops. In short, extra struts and braces and extra heavy steel throughout give the new body rugged durability. And when it comes to the chassis, Imperial has one of the most advanced in the automotive industry. Greater strength and twist resistance are provided by the full welded box section side rails. The flattened box section has unusual resistance to side impact. The rail drops under the rear compartment to allow for the new lower floor pan. What's more, the front corners are reinforced to give extra body support and the box section cross members add extra rigidity. Expert test drivers agree that the Imperial is the smoothest riding, best cornering car on the road today. It takes even the sharpest curves without tilt or sway. Of course, this is due to Imperial's torsion air suspension, the suspension system that makes coil springs obsolete. No matter how rough or tough the road, Imperial's famous torsion air suspension keeps the car on an even keel for a smooth, comfortable ride. Of course, air suspension with air springs at all four wheels was offered at extra cost last year on other cars. Tests proved it did not eliminate tilting, swaying, or dipping, but it did keep the car level at all times, regardless of load. Our engineers decided that by utilizing air to some extent, they could incorporate this leveling action with the proved benefits of torsion air. This has resulted in a new optional suspension system True Level Torsion Air Suspension. This system combines all the proved advantages of the original torsion air with the automatic leveling action of air suspension. Without True Level Torsion Air, a heavy load will cause the rear end to dip and the front to rise so that driver and passengers are uncomfortable. With True Level Torsion Air, even with a heavy load, the car stays level. And the driver and passengers enjoy a relaxed and comfortable ride. In other words, true level torsion air gives the added advantage of automatic air levelizing without any of the disadvantages of competitive air suspension systems, such as the complicated procedures necessitated by ordinary air springs when changing tires or towing a car. Without a doubt, true level torsion air is the most advanced suspension system yet developed to give us smooth, comfortable, ever-level ride. 
This is available on all Imperial models as a new feature for 1959. And for smooth, level stopping, all Imperials offer power-operated, total contact brakes as standard equipment for 1959. Imperial power brakes provide 72% of the pedal effort needed for braking to a stop. Braking is quicker and easier in an emergency, without danger of brake locking when you make a panic stab at the pedal. And for greater safety, Imperials are equipped with an independent parking brake, which is mounted on the drive shaft and entirely independent of the service brakes. Conveniently applied with a foot pedal and released by a handle, this is the most powerful brake in the industry. Another standard on all Imperials is constant control power steering. The new compact constant control unit is located under the floorboard. Constant control power steering provides full-time steering help, easier parking, quiet operation, and more on-center feel of the wheel. The new six-way power seat adjuster is standard on the Crown and LeBaron, available on the Custom Imperial for 1959. Here is fingertip adjustment for real driving comfort. And another standard on both the Crown and LeBaron is the power window lift. This too is available on the Custom Imperial. To add to Imperial's luxury ride, Custom Super Cushion tires are standard on all models. These are 14-inch tires with a wide cross-section and hold only 22 pounds of air. These large, low-pressure tires soak up rough spots and give an extra smooth ride. But one of the most important new engineering developments for 1959 is to be found right under that beautiful sloping hood. Yes, it's the new Imperial V8 engine. Larger, stronger, more efficient than ever before, yet considerably lighter in weight. Imperial's new engine has a displacement of 413 cubic inches, a compression ratio of 10.1 to 1, the carburetor is 4 barrel, the horsepower 350, and torque 470. Here's an advanced design engine that gives more power, safety, economy, and smoothness in operation for relaxed driving comfort. And for relaxed driving at night, Imperial offers two new safety features. The first is an automatic beam changer. Mounted in a small, streamlined housing on top of the instrument panel, this electronically controlled device dims the lights automatically when another car approaches and switches to high beam when the car passes. A selector knob allows pre-setting of the range from 900 to 1200 feet from the oncoming car. Manual light control can be used when desired. This device is available on all Imperial models. Also for safe night driving, Imperial introduces the Mirrormatic. This new device provides a dim image when the light intensity from the rear exceeds a preset level. A control knob selects highway or city driving or off position. Mirrormatic is not affected by neon signs or street lights. Yes, the 1959 Imperial really has everything. And let's not forget, it'll be built to new, higher standards of quality in its own special plant and given more thorough individual testing than any other car built in America. The Custom Imperial and Imperial Crown series offer four-door sedans and two- and four-door hardtops. Also, a stunning Crown convertible. The ultra-luxurious Imperial Le Baron is available in the four-door sedan and four-door hardtop. All power features are standard on the LeBaron series. With its custom-built look and its exclusive new styling features, the elegant Imperial is still the fashion leader in the field of fine motor cars. And the great 1959 Imperial is engineered for top riding comfort and performance that no other car on the road can equal. The Imperial story is the story of the greatest car ever built in America. So it's up to us to see to it that motorists do know the whole story about the Imperial for 
has been said that greatness is never achieved suddenly. Few better examples exist than the Cadillac motor car, whose supreme quality, inspiring performance, and breathtaking beauty have won for it a position without counterpart in public esteem. Cadillac's reputation as the car of cars has been almost six decades in the making. 57 years of painstaking development of those basic design and engineering concepts that make any of these proud motor cars, wherever it may be, instantly Cadillac. Cadillac qualities are thus endowed with a tradition, a continuity that appears each year in new and brilliant forms as the heritage that Cadillac, alone among motor cars, can bestow upon its owners. As a result, the creators of the Cadillac motor car face a challenge unique in motordom. To produce each year a car that surpasses any previous achievement in Cadillac's own brilliant history, while retaining the unmistakable hallmark of motordom's most renowned family of fine cars. This is a boldness and imagination, and the dedicated efforts of the finest designers, engineers, and craftsmen in American industry. A fine example of the effort required to meet this challenge is the styling development of the car. Here, preliminary concepts for the 1959 grille are under consideration. Months are consumed in the search for that elusive styling theme with the brilliant freshness, the regal elegance, and the exciting grace each such feature must have to be deserving of the name Cadillac. Hundreds of ideas are suggested, and from these, a few are considered sufficiently outstanding to be put to the test of full-scale examination. The survivor of this arduous, months-long competition is realistically finished in art as further proof of its qualification to be an accepted part of the car of cars. Now, in the three dimensions of a clay rendering, the grill becomes a gracefully integrated part of the overall movement of line of the elegant 1959 design concept. Artful painting simulates the rich, shimmering luster so characteristic of Cadillac's luxurious Fleetwood coach craft. In such painstaking development of every facet of its motor cars, exterior and interior, flourishes the secret of Cadillac's inspiring design. View now the proud result of all this dedicated enterprise. By appointment to the world's most discriminating motorists, Cadillac for 1959. will deny that here is true motoring majesty by Cadillac, a family of motor cars without peer. This is the 62 Coupe in Vegas turquoise with its sleek new silhouette featuring the widest expanse of glass and best vision for driver and passengers in all Cadillac history. The coupé for 1959 is almost four inches lower than in 1958. It's a full three inches longer, too, 225 inches. Wheelbase is now 130 inches. In both the 1959-62 sedan and the sedan de Ville, the Cadillac owner has, for the first time, the choice of two body styles distinctively different in roof contour, number of side windows, and overall height. Cadillac and Cadillac alone can offer such a choice of body styles. Here, the 62 sedan in silver represents the handsome six-window body style. This car is nearly three inches lower and eight inches longer than the 1958 62 sedan. This sedan de Ville in Georgian blue is in the smart 1959 four-window body style fully five and one half inches lower than the Sedan de Ville of 1958, this body style features a panoramic rear window and protective visor. The Coupe de Ville in Inverness Green, 
cleverly combines quiet elegance with youthful dash in a styling theme designed for the broadest possible appeal. And this Dover White 62 convertible exemplifies a sporting flair highlighting the styling of this glamorous series. The majestic grace of the Fleetwood 60 Special in Beaumont Beige is dramatically emphasized by its simple sculptured lines and flowing chrome accents. In the great Eldorado series, the dashing elegance of this Persian sand Seville exemplifies to the full the surpassing freshness of line and contour of these magnificent cars. The breathtaking smartness of this Hampton Green Biarritz for 1959 obviously qualifies it as the crown prince of the Cadillac royal family. Motoring luxury second to none is seen in the regal lines of the stunning new Fleetwood 75 limousine and the exquisitely crafted Eldorado Brome majestically crowns this 1959 Cadillac line of superb motor cars. All these stunning, boldly designed cars offer styling so sumptuous, options so exciting, engineering so advanced, that Cadillac will continue to be the unmistakable favorite of those who may choose their motor car without restriction. Let us examine in more detail the many significant advances that give the 1959 model year such a spectacular place in Cadillac's illustrious history. As seen in this 62 sedan, the treatment of the forward area of the 1959 models symbolizes the high point in styling elegance attained by the new Cadillac. The parking and directional lights, larger and individually chrome-edged, form a breathtaking cluster of gleaming chrome and crystal. In contrast, and adding further to the low, broad look of the car, are three eye-arresting horizontal lines of chrome. The bumper, massive but without a hint of heaviness, the unusual and distinctive chrome grille divider, and as a crowning feature, the line formed by the leading edge of the hood and fenders. The wider hood now extends on either side to the very centers of the fenders. This uniquely functional feature provides far better access to the engine compartment while allowing the fender crown molding to cleverly conceal the lines of the hood opening. Sparkling chrome emphasizes Cadillac's sleekly curved new Vista panoramic windshield that offers front, top, and side vision totally unapproached by conventional windshield designs. The skillfully styled horizontal lines of the front area carry the eye in natural sequence to the side of the car, where further beautifully conceived lines of chrome sweep rearward to join the graceful upward flow of the fins. Outstanding to the knowing eye is the design of the 1959 chrome moldings that taper to a delicate and thread-like thinness in a typical example of superior Fleetwood craftsmanship. Smoothly integrated into the car's undeniable feeling of motion in action is the vast expanse of safety plate glass of the new rear window. Altogether, the 1959 Cadillac has more than 40 square feet of safety plate glass. Below the rear window is the interesting new taillight styling with its airfoil look and nacelle-like housings. The backing lights are highly functional surrounded by the largest reflectors ever used for rear illumination. The jewel-like grille adds a rich sparkle to the overall treatment of the rear. A smart new vinyl-coated lining enhances the luggage compartment interior of all models. Although the deck lid has been lowered, usable luggage area remains as spacious as last year. Regal styling deserves regal dress and never have the color choices for a new Cadillac been more breathtaking. From an almost infinite number of color selections come brilliant hues of new and varied splendor for 1959. All are acrylic paints with tough plastic, adding long, long life to these arresting colors. Another outstanding advancement for Cadillac for 1959 is the new door design. There is more headroom ensuring ease of entrance. In addition, the quarter window has been moved rearward. As a result, 
the 1959 Cadillac is delightfully easy to enter and leave, despite a much lower silhouette. The dazzling new 1959 interiors are another example of superior design ideas, superbly developed in Cadillac's interior styling salon. To the Cadillac stylist, the successful interior must not only be a joy to the eye, but a source of supreme comfort, convenience, and safety every moment the driver is within the car. And the successful interior must be all these things to all members of the owner's family. In no other year has Cadillac so successfully fulfilled these high requirements. Elegant new fabrics, dazzling appointments, the latest in instrument panel sophistication, continue the Cadillac tradition of unequaled, functional high style. Safety with satisfying smartness is the theme of the new instrument cluster design. The instruments are closer to the driver's eye level and a mere two and one half inches below his line of sight. The transmission quadrant has been carefully relocated for easier viewing through the steering wheel. The smaller wheel is of an appealing new design, handsomely accented by the bright chrome horn ring. For added convenience, the clock, an advanced all-electric design, and the ignition control are closer to the driver. The enormous glove compartment is conveniently flanked by new all-metal ashtray lighter combinations. By designing into the seating of its 1959 cars, true posture control, Cadillac achieves new heights in comfort in a car long famed for its effortless driving. The elegant fabric selections in the 1959 Cadillac add richly to the luxury feel of these superb motor cars. In the 62 sedan and coupe, seven ultra-smart options are available. Typical is this glamorous combination of blue-black Carlisle cloth and blue-coated fabric. Another stunning fabric is Mojave, the satin-soft nylon material previously available only on the Eldorado Brome and the Fleetwood 60 Special. The pattern of fine, narrow pleating is another upholstery feature usually found only on the most exclusive custom-built cars. The door treatment is of equally high style. The upper portions are Alaska fab, beautifully set off by delicate brushed chrome accent strips and inlaid jewel-like crests. Below this, fabric in a vertical pleated design contrasts handsomely with the horizontal chrome divider strip and the deep pile Trieste carpeting. In the series 62 convertible, pleated patterns accented by leather-covered buttons form dazzling interiors. Seven options, all featuring luxurious leathers, are offered. Complementing the beauty of the 1959 cars are engineering advances of great significance. Consider, for example, the optional cruise control, a truly remarkable advance in the art of automatic speed regulation. The driver simply sets the control for the maximum desired speed. When the car reaches the preset speed, the driver feels a definite resistance at the accelerator pedal. Naturally, he can push through this resistance whenever he wishes, in passing, for example. For turnpike driving, the driver simply accelerates to the speed of pedal resistance and pulls the knob on the cruise control dial. This keeps the Cadillac at the preset speed automatically with no need for the driver to touch the accelerator. New three-speed all-electric windshield wipers with camomatic action clean a larger area of the windshield than on any other car. And annoying changes in the speed of the wipers are completely eliminated. Continuing the roll call of advanced engineering achievements for 1959 are important new improvements in Cadillac's safety power steering. A new rotary valve makes the 1959 inline power steering instantly responsive to the movement of the steering wheel by the driver, while fully maintaining Cadillac's famed feel of the road. When parking, the redesigned system now responds with far less driver effort making quick work of the most challenging steering maneuver. 
Important new improvements in air conditioning continue the impressive list of comfort advances in Cadillac for 1959. The passengers now have such complete control over the system, they can enjoy the exact type of cooling they prefer at all times, even when the car is parked with the engine in idle. There are now four fan speeds to establish any desired degree of air circulation. The passenger also has a choice of 100% outside air to refresh the car interior, or 20% outside and 80% recirculated air for maximum cooling. A newly located outlets at the center of the instrument panel and at either end assure gentle, refreshing, cooled air for every passenger in every part of the car. A new concept in the distribution of the air from the car's heating system means unexcelled passenger comfort during the cold months, too. The air discharge distributor is now located at the center of the cowl, and the ducts for the rear compartment follow along the top of the transmission tunnel to the rear compartment. Working as a team, the 1959 Cadillac heating and cooling systems provide the most spectacular year-round weather control ever offered. Cadillac's new frame accounts for another important advance in riding comfort. The frame's greater rigidity, plus an all-new concept of mounting the car body, add even further quiet smoothness to Cadillac's renowned ride. In addition, the 1959 Cadillac offers a highly advanced new shock absorber. In the conventional shock absorber, air and oil can mix, causing the oil to froth thus reducing its ability to dampen road shock. But in the 1959 Cadillac shock absorber, a special flexible nylon bag surrounds the oil cylinder, preventing any mixing of air and oil. The result? The most efficient shock absorber action ever attained. And Cadillac's renowned air suspension, the most thoroughly road tested of any in the industry, has been brought to a new high in engineering excellence. New front and rear levelizer valves. New bushings mean level attitudes when accelerating. Elimination of bottoming. And an overall softer, better balanced ride. Altogether, these highly significant refinements in Cadillac's frame, shock absorbers, and air suspension endow the 1959 Cadillac with superbly quiet, silky smooth driving qualities unapproached by any other motor car. Transforming all the great 1959 comfort and convenience features into flashing action on the road is the most versatile and powerful V8 engine ever to come from Cadillac factories. Highlighting the many brilliant new engineering advances are a larger intake manifold to provide more efficient intake of the air-fuel mixture into the cylinders. Increased displacement 390 cubic inches that allows more air-fuel mixture to enter the cylinder to be converted into power. Higher compression ratio, 10 and a half to one, that gives greater compression of the mixture before firing and thus squeezes more power from each drop of fuel. And tapered exhaust valves that discharge exhaust gases faster and minimize the chance of their restricting or diluting the incoming mixture. A new temperature compensated idling system automatically adjusts the flow of air in the carburetor as engine temperature changes, thus maintaining the best mixture at all times. In addition, a redesigned automatic choke control with a new heat source achieves important new fuel economies during warm-up and short-range driving. The results of these extensive power plant refinements are Cadillac's new 325 horsepower standard engine and 345 horsepower Q engine with three two-barrel carburetors. These engines are classic examples of combined fuel economy and dazzling performance that are uniquely Cadillac. Now that we've seen the 62 sedan and coupe in detail, let's look at the distinguishing features of the other models in the line. Magnificent DeVille models carry motor car luxury to even greater heights of shimmering elegance. A handsome identifying name graces the rear fender. 
Never before have the DeVilles offered such rich, surpassing beauty. As witness this superlative Coupe DeVille interior combination of green Coronado and leather with its motif of fashionable cloth-covered buttons. With such a multitude of superb high styles to choose from, the 1959 Cadillac owner has unparalleled freedom to fully express his individual taste in motor car design. The celebrated elegance of the Fleetwood 60 Special Sedan is highlighted by a richly crafted panel of concave sculpture, gracefully faced by a louver of gleaming chrome, and banded by twin moldings sweeping the full length of the car. Fairings of bright chrome over the taillight nacelles and crisp chrome edging on the trunk lid below the renowned Fleetwood name state instantly that this is a motor car of special distinction. Features distinctive to the 60 Special are electrically operated vent windows and two-way power seat. The many impeccably tailored interiors for 1959 add further luster to this car's unique reputation for unmatched elegance. For those desiring even more sumptuous motoring, the 1959 Eldorados are unsurpassed on the American road. As seen on this new Eldorado Seville, distinctive chrome upper side molding joins with the lower chrome molding to provide a bright accent for the basic body sculpture that blends masterfully into the taillight contours and the rear grille, alive with the flashing highlights from multiple rows of gleaming projectiles. In the Seville, top styling reaches a new pinnacle of fashionable design with glamorous vinyl-coated roof fabrics available in five colors, smartly keyed to the new body colors. Total driver convenience is basic in the design of these outstanding Eldorados. Electrically powered window vents and windows, tinted and shaded rear window, six-way power seat, power-operated trunk lock, radio and heater, all are standard equipment. Air suspension is also standard in the Biarritz and Seville, as is the new Cadillac Q engine, providing unparalleled performance with three two-barrel carburetors. The Eldorado Seville interiors are examples of the most distinguished interior designs in Cadillac history. Brilliant combinations of leather and brushed chrome highlight the side upholstery treatment in the Seville. The Eldorado Biarritz offers the ultra-smart bucket seats as an option to give this stunning car a dramatic air. Seven combinations of Cardiff and Florentine leathers are available in the Biarritz, each the pinnacle of luxury car furnishings. Complete restyling of the Fleetwood 75 limousine for 1959 has given this magnificent motor car the sleek, fashionable appearance that makes it appropriate for any occasion. The remarkable roominess and super luxury features of this great motor car are as attractive to the owner wishing to drive his own car as to the owner who prefers to be chauffeur driven. In 1959, the sensational Eldorado Rome once again brings to modern motoring a galaxy of years ahead features that fully qualify this extraordinary motor car to be the distinguished leader of motordom's first family of fine cars. It is now evident that in the creation of the 1959 Cadillac motor car, Cadillac designers have fulfilled their difficult assignment with surpassing brilliance. For here is a car that at one and the same time is undeniably the pinnacle of fresh, inspiring 1959 fine car styling, yet is instantly Cadillac, the motor car that so superbly combines Cadillac's traditional dignity and bearing with resplendent new design 